I'm, uh, I, I, suppose, I suppose I'm the, uh, the storyteller of WIDA. Um, people who know me know me that I like to read a lot and read books and so forth. So I just wanted to kind of summarize the story of the day very briefly. Um, what this journey through the world of aid and the social sectors ha has told us. And in some ways, it's still a, a journey, obviously, that we're making in Recom. And, you know, I do urge you to go to the website and to read all the papers and to, to reflect on some of the issues and also to come to the, the next results meeting, which will be on climate change and um, environment and the one after that on governance and the one on that after that on gender. But let's think about uh, today and some of the stories that we told each other today. And let me sort of just briefly uh, divide my remarks into what we learned about some of the successes, because there have been successes. Let me then remind us of ourselves of the many problems, but also some of the solutions. And, and then let me finally just briefly summarize some of the, the tensions or the unresolved issues that are still part of our journey through this world of of aid in the social sectors. The successes, the successes are children are vaccinated. They're vaccinated now more than they've ever been in development history. We've had successful polio programs in countries like India. We've had successes in uh, maternal and child health. We reminded this morning that child survival is now improved over the last decade. There are something like two and a half million uh, fewer deaths among children, largely through the application of rather simple technologies, but important technologies in diarrheal research and so forth, and diarrheal application and, and, and basic drugs and basic healthcare packages. And much of this is to the credit, obviously, of governments, of communities, of NGOs, but also often with the support of aid donors. We've learned that HIV and AIDS is at least contained and in some countries falling. Uh, a large proportion of the aid that has gone into the um, health sectors of African countries uh, has been uh, directed to HIV aid. And we've had more success on HIV AIDS than we would have expected uh, 30 years ago when the problem first emerged. We've seen aid fund um, the construction of global health research systems but also uh, local health research systems. We were reminded this morning of, of how uh, funding from the Gates and the World Bank has, has funded uh, basic uh, public health uh, care research in India for the first time. The first time India's had a, a really effective uh, system. Primary enrollment rates are up. When we visit African countries, we see all of the school children in their neat uniforms going off to school. And in a few countries, but too few, the quality of education has risen, most notably, actually, as we were reminded uh, by the case of Rwanda, which is a really outstanding uh, success. School feeding programs are feeding children, but they could work a lot better. And we've seen an explosion in social protection to the point where something like a billion people in developing countries, live in families where at least somebody participates in a social protection program, be it a cash transfer program or an employment guarantee scheme or whatever. And aid has had an important catalytic role there in supporting uh, technical assistance uh, for the expansion and rollout of social protection, now particularly in Africa, transferring some of the South-South success from Brazil and other countries. So we have to, in this, this game of development, and it's, it's, it, we, shouldn't really, we shouldn't call it a game. You know, it's life and death, and the social sectors are life and death. But, you know, we have to celebrate at least some success um, in a way that's important to us as a community, because those successes we have to rest upon when we come to think about some of the deep problems that we still face, that still really frustrate us uh, as practitioners, as researchers, whether we're in a bilateral agency or a multilateral agency. And what are those problems that we've highlighted this morning uh, and this afternoon, some of the solutions that we're still working on trying to find? Well, we know that health systems in many poor countries still do not respond enough to the needs of poor people. And that's not just the low-income countries, it's many of the middle-income countries as well. Uh, we know that we can have uh, some progress in that, in that area, 
particularly through uh, community action and working closer with communities. If we take out one message from health and education today, it's been greater involvement and learning with communities and not just going for templates which we bring to countries which we believe can work in all circumstances. An incredible amount of learning by doing that we've all had in that area. We know that school enrolments are up, but the quantity, uh, and sorry, the quality of education at primary level and indeed at secondary level still remains, remains extraordinarily weak. Uh, we were told about uh, Senegal, for example, which contrasts uh, to Rwanda in terms of uh, very disappointing performance in enrolment. A gentleman from the Cameroon, I believe it was, focused our attention on failure in rural primary education in the Cameroon. And really, you know, we have to set those stories about the, the real need, the real urgency to improve quality, because we know quality is so important to the effectiveness of education in achieving economic growth, and from economic growth generating more revenue, and from that more revenue generating more funding for education and health and all of the good things that we want to achieve. And we know that sustainability in education is still often very weak. In the water sector, we were reminded that the technologies are very straightforward on our blue planet. We know that we've seen progress, particularly in the large urban areas, uh, in, for example, in the South Asian cities and some African cities, but we know that we haven't rolled out enough improvement in the rural areas. And in some ways, that's where we need more uh, softer building of institutions rather than just simply a, a focus continually on the harder infrastructure. Um, and then use this wonderful uh, expression about reducing the masculinity of uh, water infrastructure, which is the first time I've sort of heard that gender dimension given to, uh, to water infrastructure. We know that from the nutrition area, uh, we're seeing progress in school feeding programs, but too much is disappearing in the pipeline. I think the, the school feeding discussion showed uh, in a very uh, good way the role of evidence and research in directing very concrete improvements about reduction in the wastage from the pipeline, about the importance of high energy uh, foods, foodstuffs, and about the importance of accountability at the community level. So we've learned a tremendous amount on, on under nutrition. We know that the numbers are still high, though, of desperately malnourished children. And in some ways, that reflects the fact that governments communities, researchers, all of us, are still not focusing enough on the ultra-poor or the chronically poor, so that poverty is still being passed from generation to generation. One thing that came out again and again is that we think aid is still too project-focused across all of the social sectors. Again and again, we were reminded of that. Again and again, appeal for better sector approaches, for better budget support, for more coordination. But it's a tough game. It's a tough game, particularly in the fragile states. But if we can achieve that, then we can achieve so much more efficiency in the use of every dollar of aid for the ultimate goal of better nourished children, more primary health care, and better education. And then in successes, sorry, in problems and uh, potential solutions, and this is the, the last one of these, we're reminded continually about the need to invest more in monitoring and evaluation, which remains extraordinarily weak in terms of both the amount of spending and the, both the amount of attention. And this is really surprising still, isn't it? Because we have this really complex aid architecture now. We have what is, in effect, um, an aircraft of aid, which is like a sort of Boeing 747 jet. You know, it's got it's got global funds, it's got bilateral funds, it's got multilateral funds on the wings and so forth. And yet we've got pilots in the cockpits, whether they're government or aid donors, with instruments that are sort of like 100 years old, almost like the Wright brothers. So that we don't really have an accurate idea sometimes of where we're going, what altitude we're flying, and how much impact we're really having on the social sectors. So I think there's been if there's one really big takeaway message from this particular meeting. It's the importance of monitoring and evaluation, putting that better instrument panel in that cockpit of aid, but also putting a better instrument panel in the cockpit of governments, because ultimately they're responsible for, for, their, uh, for their people, particularly their poorer people. 
So finally, finally in this summary, what are the, in this story of the day, what are some of the tensions that still remain for us? And in a sense, these are tensions that still challenge us, they're unresolved, but they're also going to stimulate us to greater creativity, because it's only in adversity that really, really, we really do get stimulated as a community of practitioners and researchers to look for, for better solutions. And one unresolved tension is, is aid versus domestic revenues in the financing of the social sectors. We know that many countries now have more domestic revenue because they have higher growth. And if you have better tax systems, which of course aid can help construct, then you can fund more of the good things of life, including the social sectors. We know that many uh, African countries now are exploiting the bounty of natural resources, oil and gas, which gives them so much more potential, for example, to fund social protection on that Latin American model. But equally, we know that there are the Malawis of the world, <laughs> the Burkina Fasos, the less favored by nature, the less favored by economic growth. Do they really have enough domestic revenue fully to finance what we need? And what is going to be the role of aid versus domestic revenues in those countries? What is going to be the role of aid in the poorer states of some of the middle-income countries, for example, India or Brazil? Is there still a role? These are unresolved tensions. To a degree, they're ethical tensions. We've seen that, and this is something that Bob Bolsch pointed us to, aid to the social sectors is at best neutral with respect to the poverty of the recipient countries. And this bears on the debate about the allocation of aid across low-income countries versus the middle-income countries, something that the last, section, the last session really explored, and I don't need to dwell on that. But this is really, in some ways, also an ethical issue helping a poor person in a middle-income country versus helping a per poor person in a low-income country. And it's a political issue. It's still an unresolved tension. Th the third unresolved tension in my mind, in a sense, was has the drive for greater efficiency, greater coordination in aid, really stalled? And at some point, there was a sort of almost sense of despair across the community. You know, Paris declarations, Accra, Busan, etc. Have we really stalled out on that? Yeah? Have we really lost our drive on that? Well, I leave that for you, particularly in the agencies, to, to come back to and focus on. Penultimately, and this came up also in the last session, how much do we really want to focus on our resources on the provision of global public goods, particularly in health, the drive to lower the cost of medicines, versus the commitment of in-country programs and the resourcing of those? Obviously, a tension there. Uh, we want to do both, but we don't have resources for everything in life. How are we going to move on that? And then finally, I'd like to return, and this is the last tension which should lead us to greater creativity, which is the point that Finn Tarp raised at the very outset of this meeting, which is although we can see many immediate gains from aid to the social sectors, for example, the child who ceases to have diarrhea, the child who grows and goes to school for the first time. Equally, quite a lot of the benefit of aid in the social sector is in the medium to long term. It's when that child finally finds some worthwhile work, when that child earns an income from the human capital aid might have created 10, 15 years ago. How do we break away, sometimes for our short-term focus, our drive to focus on the short-term because we want to show quick results, rather than using aid to support perhaps longer-term growth? So these are all issues and, and, and tensions that we should, which can drive forward further creativity about aid. So, as I said at the beginning, the story of Recom continues. Please do go to the website. There are many videos, including there'll be videos of this meeting. Please do come to our next uh, uh, results meetings on uh, climate change, environment, governance, gender, and please do uh, contribute with us to the debate. Thank you very much. <laughs>